Hey guys, this is Nick at Stridewise.com and today I'm bringing you an interview with Wyatt Gilmore, a former professional motocross racer and founder of one of the hottest footwear companies in the space, Grant Stone. Grant Stone is making serious, serious waves in the industry for producing what many consider olden quality shoes for Red Wing prices which might sound incomprehensible to the average person, uh, but it essentially means that their shoes cost one or $200 less than you'd imagine. Uh, their praises are consistently sung on the Goodyear Welt subreddit, and I might also note that their Penny June Loafer is the only shoe I've ever given my father. That's how legit the quality is. There he is, enjoying them on a hot Christmas morning in Australia. Here he is. Hey, how are you doing, man? Thanks for coming on. Do you want to start the interview? Talk about shoes? We can get started. Cool. So uh, we both lived in China for a long time. My viewers might not know that uh, I spent two years in Shanghai and you spent eight years down south in Xiamen, China's Miami, where you started your company and where your shoes are still made today. Um, what precipitated that decision to go to China? I guess really it stemmed from, I was, I was being homeschooled starting in like the ninth grade. Um, yeah, for motocross and to be able to spend more time away from Michigan, you know, to, to, to race down there and basically it's a training facility and stuff. So after those, those years of racing and, and everything else, at the end of it, um, it was basically like, you know, it's time to, to move on and do something else. And my dad was still kind of working with the factory. You know, he's had a, a long relationship with them, I think, since like the early, probably like 92, 3, 4, one of those years. So I guess he had spoken with the factory owner, uh, Andy, and, and he was like, sure, you know, no problem. He wants to come check it out whatever else. And so it was more of one of those situations of just, well, Hey, I'll go take a look and kind of, you know, have this travel over to Shaman and to Taipei because our, our office is in Taipei. So I feel like we're missing some steps here though. You keep talking about the factory and the shoe factory, but you're not talking about Grand Stone. Like that was only founded in 2016, right? Like what, what, it, what is the company you're talking about? I feel like I'm missing something. Why, why, why are you in Shaman shoe factories? It's it's basically there with my dad where he he was in the shoe industry his whole life you know working you know for Alden and then he ended up meeting this uh, the current owner's father at a I want to say in Vegas through a mutual friend and this was like a shoe show and um, they asked him you know what what he was doing everything else and they were basically this factory the ones that we work with now when I, when I refer to the factories I'll just say uh, it's it's a family, a Taiwanese family who owns the factories. At the time, they're making lower price point shoes. And I'm not exactly sure what caused the big change, but it wasn't going where they wanted to. They wanted to make higher price point things, probably because of volume, the size of the factories. Generally speaking, I mean, everyone has kind of their opinion on what's a big factory or, or not, but the factories that we have, specifically like in Shaman right now, um, it's not that big. So the people who work on the Grandstone product right now, I mean, it's probably ranging from 10 to 14 people, you know, in total that work on the Grandstone products and they're not working on them around the clock. I mean, that's our goal, but you know, we have a lot of lapses there because we just don't have the, you know, the pairs to do that. So back at that time, they wanted to start to make leather shoes, something a higher price point. They didn't have the volume. They couldn't compete with a bigger factory. So that's kind of the direction they wanted to go. And so my dad stepped in and went over there and a combination of introducing new customers, helping a little bit, probably on the shoe side, the development stuff on the shoe side for these specific customers in the U S and eventually getting into Goodyear Welt for American companies. And that was in the early nineties. And so that's kind of what turned everything there and turned this factory into, you know, with them into a Goodyear Welt you know, shoe factory. And so from that point on, I want to say it was always heavily percentage wise, more good your wealth than, than cement or anything else. So when I had finished motocross, everything else, my dad was just like, why don't you go take a look this? I mean, this is the factory he's been working with all the time. And, and really at that point, it's almost like family as far as Andy, the owner and his dad, Leo, um, you know, they, they always had a close relationship. And so they're like, yeah, just come over and he can, you know, he can crash in our apartment, whatever, and I can take him to Shaman to show the factory. And, you know, it's a cool place to go check out anyways, if you're just touring around. So 
that's kind of what it turned into um, and then got over there and just kind of had interest. Okay, so your dad was working in two factories in China, you were in your early 20s, you'd finished up with motocross, and he was like, hey, you're looking for something to do next, why don't you check out these shoe factories and see if shoe making is something you'd be into. And you saw there was like high quality stuff and decided to start your own brand after working at the, at the factories, with the factories? My dad's connection was to this, the current owner's dad. Um, he's only worked with this one factory ever in China. He's never worked with any other factories, just, just this one factory and this one family. So it's kind of been the one family the whole time. And so that's when I went over there and when I was working for them, it's so like the first, I mean, the first six years or so, seven years, it was actually, I was just developing and, and doing uh, more stuff on the line. Um, just, just, uh, you know, management for production and, you know, that starting from development through uh, commercialization into production. So the Grant Stone thing didn't come along until probably six years after working there, you know? So that was more, Definitely towards the end, uh, the majority of my time there was working for the factory, helping other brands, you know, these American customers. I think my audience would probably be interested in um, like your genetic lineage in, in footwear. Like, like your grandfather worked for Alden, is that right? Yeah, yeah, he was, he was there for 60, I wanna say just over 60 years. I, mean, I don't know if it's 61, 62, but it's over 60 years. And Grant Stone is the name of someone who worked with him, right? Yep. Grant Stone was also an Alden shoe salesman. Very cool. So you were just like growing up hearing about shoes and Goodyear welts your entire life? Yeah. Yeah. And my dad, I mean, he worked at Alden as a, as a salesman in the Midwest. That's how we ended up here in Michigan. Um, he met my mom here when he was a salesman um, for Alden over here in the Midwest. And so he ended up settling down here. Um, you know, so he, he did that for probably 15 years or something uh, with, with Alden. Was it always fated for you to go into footwear? Like, were you like three years old and being told one day, son, you're going to be picking out welts from Kentucky? Not really. My dad was, he never really talked about it that much. Um, my grandpa did, you know, he was like, Alden like was his life. He loved the people there. He loved his customers. His, his retailers were his best friends. And so like, what for him, it was hundred percent. Like he was the shoe guy. I imagine that once you were competing in motocross, he was like, all right, this kid is definitely not going to go into shoemaking. And then he just wound up doing an about face and going right into shoemaking from the motocross. Didn't, didn't cut it doing that for a career. So uh, at that point, I was still young enough, like I could go to school or something. And so before making that final decision, that's kind of when I went over there to, to check it out and ended up, you know, not, not going to school. I didn't go to college or anything like that. Great. So um, um, this is a question that I imagine you have to answer like 50 times every day. Uh, and I'm very apologetic because, you know, you've been asked this so many times and it's something very boring for you. But just because people always ask it, uh, how do you respond to customers who like your boots and then they hear they're made in China and then they dismiss them? Like, I don't, I don't want anything made in China. Yeah, I mean, that's a really tough one because obviously we think about it a lot because it's, it's probably the number one hurdle we always have, you know, which I never anticipated that being the issue until recently. It's just blatantly obvious. We realized, I mean, that's just going to be the, you know, the number one hurdle we have every single day, especially when it comes to, I mean, growing or doing more pairs. I mean, we're shipping five, 10 pair a day. I mean, it's, it's a very, very small operation. There's three of us in here, you know, myself, Josh and, and Parker who are, you know, next door. Um, in, in the same office here. And so it's like, you know, anything we do, it, it turns into that. I mean, and my answer is, it depends on where it is. If it's an Instagram or Facebook comment or something like that, it, it gets into politics and it's kind of like, well, how do you change, you know, a Republican to a Democrat or a Democrat to a Republican? It's like, you, you kind of like stay away from that because it's just, it's so much more than that. You know, it's, it's, what's their experience? Have they traveled there? Who do they know that's from this country? What's their news saying? I mean, we're basically, I mean, China this year is, is the, one of the number one talking points in our country as being number one, you know, we should be opposed to it to the nth degree. So it's kind of like to be okay with it and open with it would almost be strange, you know, because we're, everything is leaning towards it's, it's bad you know, spent time there. The people there in general are great people. And the culture is amazing as far as people as a whole, 
you know, the culture is amazing uh, in the factory. Same thing. You've got people who worked in there for 10, 15 years. It's a completely different culture, um, but it's great in a lot of ways. And so it's just like when it comes to quality and the product, I guess my only like easy way to kind of sum it up quickly is like, you know, when Phil Knight went there in, I don't know, 1980, you know, and he's looking to transfer, you know, production from Japan and, and Taiwan to China. Why did he do that? There's a labor pool in China. You know, why did China get, what, what is part of the reasons China gained access to all of this manufacturing and all these contracts from Americans? They have a labor pool and they're good at manufacturing. But if you have a product in your brand and you're making a lot of a brand and you're making it, let's say you have a few different products and they're different price points. If today I'm starting a new shoe brand, let's say it's sneakers and they're high end, but I have to manufacture in a few different areas. If I'm making a $500 sneaker, I'm probably going to manufacture that one in Italy. Right. And then, you know, maybe a $300 or $200 one in Mexico and then the $150 price point, let's put it in China. And I think that's just, that's always kind of been that way. You know, it's not like you want to produce a bad product to go to China. It's, are you looking at volume? What's your price point? What materials you're going into it? So, and we see that, we see that with customers before Grandstone started and everything else. I mean, it's a very, very clear idea. And so in our situation, it just so happens to be our factory is a little bit smaller and made a decision to do make good your welch shoes, you know, 25 years ago. But I, I think today, if you're starting a company and you want to market it, especially to Americans, it's pretty difficult to go, Hey, I'm going to spec all the best things in this, you know, in this wool coat, I'm going to spec the best stuff, you know, out of, out of Italy, you know, the best buttons, everything, best horn, everything, and then make it in China. The people who would be in the brand, they'd be like, are you sure about that? Like, even if the quality is good, what are we doing here? What, what's our marketing plan? What are we doing here? You know, we could mark it up, whatever else, make the same product in another country that has a much better sound to it and no stigma, even if it's 25% more, you know, same product, would that not be a better option here? Um, and also, you know, how many suppliers in China make very top, you know, high end top coats that are small quantity. So I think it's just a natural progression of people have gone there to produce volume. They, so manufacturers, these plants, everything, they've been made and designed to, to do volume. And so volume in general is usually not handmade quality products and things like that, but there's exceptions, right? Whether it's electronics or whatever. So I, I, and I think anyone knows that like, yeah, Chinese can, you know, Chinese factories can make very, very good things as well. But I think it's beside their point. It's like, well, I don't like China. And you know, you, most of their stuff isn't high end. So uh, last time I bought something made in China that I paid a lot of money for or whatever, you know? So it's, it's a, I think the only thing we can do is just be in it long enough and not make mistakes with quality and, and what we do. I mean, that's the only real thing that seemed to work so far. The marketing side of things, it, it, you know, saying, you know, well, you know, we use these materials and that's why the stuff coming out of our Chinese factories better. It doesn't really work. You know, it might get them to think about a little bit, but I've never changed anyone's mind. That's for sure. You know, um, not with words, you know, and so maybe that's, you know, something I should work on a little bit, but you know, it's, it's more probably hearing it from another customer who said, Hey, I got them. And I love the break of the Chrome Excel. I love the last and you know, whatever, but you know, the, the talking about it and stuff is it's, it's so difficult, you know? Yeah. And that's, that's something I really noticed with the brand as it's grown throughout the years. Like when, when I first saw it surfacing on Reddit in 2017, I think was when I first started seeing Grant Stern in 2018, uh, people are skeptical, but now like no one is skeptical about Grant Stone. Like I see it every other day on the Goodyear Welt subreddit. Uh, people saying how much they love the product, that they're going to go broke buying Grant Stone. Like it really was just like you said. Like you just have to knuckle down and like prove that you can you can do something. Like you know prove that you're going to be uh, 
that you've accomplished something incredible, you know? Like you've done something really, really impressive here with what you've got and you, ha you, you just have a product that like destroys skepticism, you know? And that's not to blow smoke up you, but it's just like you've, you've accomplished something undeniable, I think. Like, like no one who's handled your shoes has been unimpressed with the quality, right? Especially if made in China, but even if but not made in China. Thanks. I mean, it's, it, and it's really, I mean, we would have, we've tried, we've tried to use marketing, things like that too. But even today, and you mentioned the Reddit forum, and I mean, it's like, honestly, the majority of our sales are from Reddit, like hands down. So we're definitely in that, that little niche market. But, but the boots are actually very American, right? Like, like I saw a, a boot where the leather sole was from Keystone, Pennsylvania, the welt was from Massachusetts. The upper was from Halloween in Chicago. The lining was from Milwaukee. Like besides being made in China, they're extraordinarily American boots. Like more than I think a lot of made in America boots, I imagine. Like, like is anything actually Chinese in the construction of the boots? The, the way where we get away from the US on some of the components is just for some of the uppers, if we go to like Italy or France or, you know, CF Stat or whatever from England, but you know, most of the reason why we're using the, you know, barber from Massachusetts or whatever for welts is just because that's just kind of our connection. Um, not only starting with, you know, my dad or, or me, but the factory owner being an American Taiwanese and everything else. Um, there's not too many of these suppliers. So, you know, it, it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward and they kind of like funnel into one direction. If you're like, Hey, I want a kudu. It's like, well, I think, you know, where you're going to go to get the kudu, you know, it ends up, you know, in England, you know, or I want to, you know, a pull up leather. It's like, you know, probably going to go to with Chrome Excel um, for, for our particular market and for what we feel, you know, yeah, you, you kind of end up doing that. But as far as um, anything in China, I mean, our packaging, you know, our box, which we, we've done, yeah, our box is a story in itself, but these, shoes when they're six, seven pounds, you know, and being delivered, especially if there's returns or something, it's just inevitable that the size will start to crack and things like that. And so like, we have been like beefing up our box more and more. So like our new box that just came in, it's dual wall all the way around and everything else. And it's finally not breaking. And it's just like, yeah. So that South China, um, you can pretty much stand on it if you want. You could definitely stand on this box, but, um, you know, all the packaging in, inside that's in China. Um, and that's it. I think our laces, our laces are from Taiwan, but Asia, I, I think those are the only things. I mean, our cork is from the U S um, you know, the insoles, the insoles. Um, usually those are coming from, from Mexico, um, those bends. And so, yeah, the lining uppers, all that stuff are, are just those specialized tanneries. Um, and I guess even our laces, you know, the, the leather boot laces, those are from Kentucky. So it's like, it just kind of depends, you know, but not, not too much there and no specific reason other than, you know, there isn't, you know, small boutique tanneries in China focusing on, you know, French calf, you know, it's just not, not going to, not going to happen probably. So. I was taking notes earlier. You said there are 10 to 14 people working on Grant Stone and you guys sell five to 10 boots a day. Is that right? The average is difficult because one thing we're, we're still learning is um, I, in general, the Goodyear Welt sales seem to be, I mean, they, they do much better towards the fall time, not to mention, you know, the holiday on itself, which always helps things holiday seasons, but just the boots, uh, even, even loafers and, and I mean, even shoes, I mean, they tend to do better towards the fall time, you know, and, and over the holidays and stuff. So, yeah, I mean, today, you know, I think we, you know, we have like seven labels to print out. And the diesel boot is your most popular boot, right? Why, why do you think that is? It just naturally progressed that way. It just seems like people tend to like boots in this segment. You know, maybe it's easier to wear with more things. It just seems to be more popular than a plain toe shoe, for example. Um, and it's always like that. Like if we have a family member or something who has a boyfriend or a husband or, you know, we have an uncle, it's always like, I'll grab a boot, you know, it versus, well, I don't, I don't dress up or anything, so I'm not going to wear, even though a lot of guys would never consider our plain toe shoes, dress, dress shoes or something, you know, they're like, why well, I don't, I don't wear dress shoes, you know? So, um, and then the loafers, that's, that's very hit or messy. The people like them or they don't, you know, it's people who live on the coast and cities seem to, uh, to go lean towards the loafers a little bit more, but 
in general, the boot seems to be doing much, much better. So like the Crimson Diesel boot is, is our number one seller. Yeah, it's funny. I got, I got the penny loafers that the, uh, the June Chrome XL one which were everywhere in like uh, 2019. And my sisters chipped in as well. Like I got them for my dad, right? So my, my sisters chipped in. Uh, I brought the shoes over from the US to Australia for Christmas. It was like, it was like the gift for dad and in the whole, my family's household. Um, and he unwrapped them. And the first thing he said, after he said these look really pretty, the first thing he said was, wow, where were these made? And um, you know, <laughs> and it was like, well, don't ask that. <laughs> Cause when I say China, you know, you guys really you went big for me this year, huh? Made in China, yeah. I um I said in my Instagram post when I shared that picture of the the June penny loafer, uh, I said it was the official shoe of 2019. Um, I was just being cute, but like that that shoe, it seemed like it really was everywhere that year. Is that a pretty big seller as well, or was it just completely in my head that the uh, the natural Chrome XL penny was like a, a massive seller for you guys? Yeah, I mean it it did it it turned into something. At first, everything. I don't know if it's the way we release things or what, but if they never perform well when we release it, like the first month or something, we're always kind of like let down a little bit. We're like, yeah, it should pick up, I think, you know, like kind of waiting for things to pick up a little bit. And then the penny was probably the best example of that. It didn't do that well to start, but then you think about it. It's just like, well, the first thing people do is they go to Reddit or Southform or Google to see how do they fit? Like what's people's, you know, and so there's nothing there. There's nothing there to reference. So they're like, I don't want to get this thing and it doesn't fit. And I think as a whole, it's our second best pattern. You know, the, it's a diesel boot and then the penny loafer. So outperforming, I think the, the plain toe shoe in the long wing over like a year's time. So what kind of shoes are in the future for Grant Stone? Like what kind of uh, plans, new models, that kind of stuff? Like what, what can I tease people with? Um, I, I, I show you, actually, I show you just, uh, you just uh, released the Mokto work boot, the, the brass boot, you call it. Um, so check that out, the brass boot. It's Grant Stone's first like work boot type boot. Um, what else is in the future for, for you guys? Well, we, we have a, uh, a boot coming this fall. It's going to be a work boot. Yeah, and I guess outside of that, working on a chukka, um, which would be sometime mid next year, and then also um, a tennis shoe, a sneaker. So... Um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how those things come along. Hopefully, hopefully here, like early summer. A tennis shoe, like a Grant Stone sneaker. That's a, that's a pretty big deal. I hope it is. I hope so. I mean, we like it so far. Like there's so many like good sneakers out there, whether you're looking at, you know, something all the way from like a common project, like a dress sneaker to, you know, the new brands like Koyo or, or whatever. So there's a lot of that out there we can use something that we would actually wear, like the saddle tan Minerva leather, like how patina is everything else, but on a sneaker. Um, so I, I think that's the direction we're gonna be going, is kind of using Chrome XL, using uh, CFZ suede, using, you know, maybe a Kudu, using uh, the, the Minerva saddle tan um, article, and, and do it like on a cup sole, and, and using some of our current materials. And, and also like realistically, it's one of the things we, we talk about all the time. It's not something, you know, we're going to sit there and market, but those are the leathers we already use. And we, it's the logistics part of it is, is huge because we barely meet minimums as it is. So like, if we're going to do something like this, you know, I'm not going to most likely, especially first few years, like go to Italy and, and, and find like a, a brand new leather we've never used before like an article sometimes i wish i could do that it's just not it's not very realistic you know for us at this point to do something like that and so uh it just so happens to be that it works out like the product actually it looks really good it's pretty unique and it's like well everyone has a sneaker it's like yeah but you know where can you buy you know this trainer like this with uh the minerva box like saddle tan vegetable tan leather you know where where can you get something like that there's not too many options. Most of them seem to be, you know, calf, very clean, white, gray, black on black, um, you know, black calf with, you know, white outsole, whatever. So this would be a little bit more of our, our leathers, but on a, on a, on a you know, on a sneaker. All right. So it's a casual sneaker with boot leather. That's pretty cool. Um, I've had you for a very long time. Is, is there, a, I should probably let you go. Is there anything you want to add though? Anything I might've... I'm going to miss anything you want to get the word out about. 
I guess the only thing we're kind of looking to do is I know sometimes a lot of our customers, they tend to be people who are, are, are looking for E and triple E wits and stuff. And so we get a lot of questions about the narrow and everything, but yeah, I mean, that's the only thing we're trying to do a little bit more of here in the next couple of years is, is try to get into those wits and the, and the styles that we currently don't. So hopefully that's, that's kind of the goal long-term is to kind of have everything that we offer, you know, in, in multiple wits. Um, and so something like a sneaker, it's going to be like, unfortunately it'll be an average start, but if, if it works out and everything without a doubt, it's like, okay, we're going to, we're going to move into wits, you know, and get those last and, and do all that stuff. So that's kind of the goal. Um, and so we, we try to talk about that a little bit because it's a total pain to have wits and everything else. So it's like, if, if we're going to do it, you know, we should make sure that uh, we do it right. And um, once we get a better idea of, of how it's moving, then we can kind of estimate, you know, how many pairs of like wits we can buy and all that stuff. So. Cool. Uh, great. Okay. Um, that's it. That's, that's everything. I should, I should, I should get out of here. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah. Thank you. Take care.